You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and my guest is Dr. Joan Nichols. Um, she's going to be talking about, uh, well, she has her own lab, the Joan Nichols lab, and uh, they're working on growing lungs in the lab, lab-grown lungs. And uh, as someone with asthma all their life, this is a uh, an interesting topic to me. I think it'll be interesting to the listeners. So, uh, Joan, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Yeah. So tell me... Um, why lungs? What's the uh, the interest there? Why the focus on them? <laughs> Why lungs? That's a longer story than I think you have time for, but I can kind of let you know that basically um, our, the, the reason that I got interested in this work at all in bioengineering organs is because there's a lot of people on transplant lists that don't get an organ or get an organ that there may be a problem with and then their graft fails them and then they die. And so I had studied the lung for a very long period of time. So that's why we focus on the lung in my laboratory. But our basic premise is, is that instead of waiting until someone dies and donates their organs for transplant, we were trying to, to determine even ourselves, could we produce something, a lung that was good enough for, to transplant that uh, would actually function and provide some benefit and not be... Um, so poorly developed that it caused problems for, for an animal and a model that you were going to transplant into. So you're trying to grow um, for humans, or are you doing it first for animals, and are you trying to grow, you know, one lung, uh, well, so, just part of a lung? You know, what's your <laughs> so, well, you start small. So about, let me say, like 16 or 17 years ago, I was very happily making quarter-sized pieces of lung tissue that I was using as a model to study respiratory infections and what respiratory infections did to people, and what asthma does to people, how the immune system drives what happens in asthma, and things like that. And I met my now research partner, whose name is Joaquin Cordiella, and he's a physician. And so he kind of said, well, if you can make something that's the size of a quarter, what would it take to make something? And then he pointed to his chest. He said roughly this size, and he kind of went from his neck to his diaphragm, indicating, could I make something like a full lung for an individual for a transplant. And so that started a stepwise process of going in that direction to kind of first see, could we figure out a process to do it? And if we could do it, could we do it with, with human cells? Did we Could we do it with stem cells? What would be required to sort of like work out the recipe for it? Like you're going to bake a cake and you want that cake to be the same every time you make it? Because if you're in a bakery and your job is to make a cake, it should be perfect every time. The chocolate cake should taste like a chocolate cake every time. The same thing should be true is not only did we want to prove that we could do it once, we wanted to prove you could do it again and again and again and have good results and produce something that was reasonable, that would be as good maybe as what we were getting in terms of donating lung. Well, again, when when you say, you know, a quarter-sized piece of lung, does that mean the alveoli portion in a human, yeah, does kind that of, mean the upper bronchial? I mean, what is, um, where is it? Both. I mean, to... so so you can model um, the bronchi. So if you're interested in asthma, you model the bronchi or the trachea. Um, for lower lung, you model the alveoli. And so when I say modeling it, 
you pick a region and I develop a model system, a small one, that has the same cells that are in those areas that you can perturb with something in the environment like a allergen if you want to look at asthma or if you want to look at a respiratory pathogen, what happens in an alveoli when you get, say, a very bad influenza infection, what happens to the cells and how do they respond? And so that's what modeling is. You take a a very small population of cells on some type of structure that supports them to give it a three-dimensional shape, and you and you kind of expose it to something and see what happens next. So they're about so the size I, of a quarter. So it's a miniature lung. Does it have you know a bronchus that branches out into alveoli, or what does it look like morphologically? It depends on what you make. So morphologically, for the ones that are upper respiratory tract, it looks like. A, it looks very flat, although it's dimensional, and it has a stack of cells like you would find in a bronchi. It's not the whole bronchi. It's an area that's a small size, but it includes all of those cell types, and they're growing so that you can have the cells bathed in media or a nutrient solution, and then have the upper part of the cells have a area where they come in contact with the air so they can develop normally. That would be a bronchial model. Lung models can be balls of cells that look very much like an alveolus, and you grow them and culture them, and you can do, make many of these um, repeated structures and, and have them for study. So that's what kind of what we started with was something very small. But you realize that when you're talking, you're talking about something that's complex where you want bronchi branching out and having alveoli at the end and having areas where you would have gas exchange and things like that. That's something much bigger and much more complex and a whole lot harder to do. Well, if you want to study the upper part of the lung, I mean, that's where that gas exchange doesn't happen, but gas exchange passes by. The gas exchange the passes bronchus, by, right. So in asthma, yes, because you have that swelling of the tissues and, and the contraction of the muscles of that bronchus, you close it down so air doesn't move through that conduit anymore, that tube anymore. So that's why asthma is bad. But you can make models that respond like that, that you can actually evaluate and, and, and determine what's going on on a small scale. But if you're making it up, if you're taking it to something bigger, it's a lot harder to deal with a very complex model or even to make something that's like a lobe of a lung. So we started out kind of working with lots of different materials that are natural and man-made to kind of evaluate what kind of structural support would you need? What would be the skeleton of the lung that we could put the cells back on to let us do something bigger? And so we developed a process that could take a damaged lung that had no viable cells in it, that was just damaged and had been procured for transplantation but failed and had nothing live in it anymore. And the process takes out all the blood, all of the cells, and just leaves that skeleton behind as a natural scaffold. So believe it or not, before we did animal lungs, we we actually developed human-sized lungs, pediatric-sized lungs, where we learned what cells you'd need to have, could we do it with stem cells or not, and there are a lot of issues with trying to grow something that big from just from stem cells, but could we do it with cells that were isolated from other lungs, like an adult-sized lung? Could we construct something that would function from all of the bits and pieces so instead of learning how it worked by taking it apart, we were learning how it worked by putting it back together, kind of flip it around. Hmm. I have so many questions. You know, like, for instance, if you take the lungs of a newborn and you take the lungs of an adult and you look at them, what grows over time? Is it that the number of alveoli increase? Is it just the distance, you know, from the initial uh, tubes going into the lungs to the alveoli? Everything Is there grows. more branching that happens? Yeah. I mean, what, what have you observed? All of it. So so you've got to realize in growth from something like a fetal-sized lung to an adult lung, there is increase in size, increase in complexity, increase in the number of cells. So your lung, um, and like some other organs of your body, but especially your lung, the cells of your lung are always modifying that scaffold that holds them. They're always changing it and recovering from injury because you breathe all the time. I mean, and we expect to breathe for quite a while, but the act of breathing and breathing in the particles that are in your environment that are not even infectious materials can damage your lung. And so your lung is always healing itself. And in that process as it heals and you have to have that expansion in size going from small as a child to big as an adult, you increase the structure constantly. 
in size. But you reach a point when you're an adult where you're not really reforming the larger structures anymore. You're not enlarging them. You're just holding it steady state. And that doesn't mean you're not, you don't have stem cells there and they're not repairing the lung constantly. It just means in terms of growth, which is a different process, that that's not happening anymore. Um, although there is a lot of repair all the time. And it's those same mechanisms that are involved at both stages that are helping you to grow and to also help you, you know, take care of that lung over time as you breathe. And so that's kind of learning how those processes work and how the growth happens has been a huge part, I mean, of some of the really amazing things that we found as we were doing these studies. Because every time we would come to a point where we had a stumbling block, and so first it was what scaffold should we use, and then it was what cell type should we use, and then it's what what growth factors or specialized protein messengers did we need to include that help the cells figure out what they needed to do. I mean, that's why it's taken the last 16, 17 years to get to the point where we did a feasibility study, because it took a heck of a long time to figure out for each individual piece, how would you reconstruct that piece? What do you need in the trachea? What do you need in the bronchioles? What do you need in the vascular system of the lung, which is this huge branching vascular system that's right next to the branching airway? And what do you need for those alveolar structures where gas exchange happens? And so just what you asked me, I mean, it's huge. Well, I could see that you you get certain insights from studying the evolution of lungs. You know, let's say from the swim bladder up to you know amphibious and reptile and then mammal lungs and bird lungs, and they're all different. Um, and then you'd also see it in the development of a human what's happening. And then you'd also see based on various disease states and different parts of the lung what's happening. And yep. so I'm sure there's all kinds of fascinating insights. There's also, and so understanding, so a little bit in terms of background for a research scientist like myself, um, pretty much you take basic coursework and, um, for me, embryology, a, a lot of physiology, anatomy, things that were like building blocks for me that gave me information I needed, a lot of physics and chemistry that gave me an understanding about things like shear force as a cell moves through these tubes. You know, how much is too much force what, that breaks them up? What is too little force that they stop moving? All kinds of things that feed into taking on a project like this that made it possible because it wasn't just me, but also a group of other scientists that all came together and their backgrounds are in very different areas. And a lot of clinicians that came together that said, if we're going to do this, what do we need to do? And pooling our knowledge together. So there's, a, I, I am part of a big research team that I manage that has, you know, um, cardiothoracic surgeon who's really important because he had to explain what he needed to have in a transplant, what he was looking for, how is a regular transplant done, um, you know, from a technical side, what he would do, what does he need to be able to manage, how long does it take, all the way through to somebody that's a respiratory therapist that that helped us understand in respiratory therapy, what are the things you need to keep the airways open and functioning and in order for an animal or eventually a person to breathe properly and what happens after a transplant with a normal person. Um, anybody who would receive a transplant and then go on and have a good life, what is that, you know, what's happening through their, their, their time frame from when they receive the transplant that would influence what their outcome was and how long they survived. So we all would sit and talk about each of these stages while in the lab we were working at modeling each of the different parts of the lung and figuring out ways to put this whole process together to come to the point where in a meeting of the minds we came, you know, we produced first large structures. First we produced, and actually, actually when you asked it, we produced a lobe. We produced a lobe of human tissue. We didn't transplant it, of course, but we produced it and we then we assessed it. How good was it? Were the cells where they supposed to be? Did it, you know, did it have at the very smallest levels the thin membranes that you require in an alveolus to support gas exchange? Because it's not just gas exchange. It's having the air move through those conduits into the tissue and then having it, the red blood cells sitting in the capillaries close enough to the type 1 cells that are involved in gas exchange, just a very thin walled cell, looks like a fried egg. They got to be really close together with very thin membranes to let oxygen move from the air you breathed in to the red blood cell so it can pick up the oxygen. And then that red blood cell goes through your body and delivers it everywhere it needs to be delivered and picks up carbon dioxide to bring back to the lungs. So when you breathe out, you get rid of that metabolite, that byproduct that's made as a process. Yeah. 
I mean, that's an I amazing thing. I have a couple questions about this. Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's super amazing. I've got a, a whole bunch of questions. That's mind. okay. No, no, One I'm is, good. Um, what, what's the speed at which red blood cells travel through the capillaries that are right next to the alveolus? You know, how fast or how slow do they need to move for the gas exchange to happen and the, the gas to migrate in and out of the necessary cells in the, in the capillaries? So that process is really slow. Um, in terms of speed from our side, because we can mimic this, you're talking about, for, for us, moving media through um, a bioengineered blood vessel at the lowest speeds that some of my very small pumps will let me do. So it's less than a couple of microliters, you know, in, in, in like an hour. And so our red blood cells move through our body a lot faster than that. The, the thought process is, is that it takes about 60 seconds for a red blood cell to move through the whole cycle through your, you know, through tissues. But in the capillaries, the cells slow down very much. There's no push from your heart behind it and your blood pressure is much there. And so the cells move very slowly because you have to allow for this process of gas exchange to happen because it's based on the fact you have a gradient difference. The Air that's in the lung is high oxygen, the, the, um, and then that high oxygen has to move to the low oxygen where you have the capillaries that don't have any oxygen they're bringing CO2 in to get rid of, and you get that exchange of oxygen onto the red blood cell and CO2 back that's released. So that's a very slow cell movement. But you have to, when the cells are moving through your heart, they're moving really thick, you know, really quickly based on that pumping action of your heart. So you have this interesting thing where you've got the pumping action of your heart that's moving these cells really quickly, and then the cells slow down when they go through into the tissues to allow them to, you know, to do whatever they need to do in terms of management of CO2 levels in tissues and then bringing oxygen in and releasing it. So in terms of speed, yeah. you know, they move pretty quickly, but in the capillaries not so much because they need to move slower. So it's not so much. Yeah, imagine a, a, a single cell going down a narrow tube, you know, the, i.e. the capillary. Oh, and yeah. When it first enters the exchange area, it's high CO2, low O2, and then as it moves through, there's a point where they're, I guess, equal or yeah. midway, or, and then when it exits, reverse. they're the opposite way. Wherever. Yeah, and then and then you release it, and so that process may sound really simple, but it, the fact that we can do it throughout all of those very complex tissues through your body is huge because that means that cells that are in your heart or in your muscle or, you know, in your skin all get supported with oxygen on a, on a constant basis from this one mechanism that the lung provides in terms of gas exchange. And when we think about the lung, we always think about it, and, and I did too. When we first started this process, I was very focused on the small parts of the lung, the gas exchange areas, figuring that if we could make them first, make the, the walls of those cells and the capillaries thin enough or develop a method that would let us do that, that's the function we're trying to replace. And it is true. That was really important. But we also had to think about the bigger structures that support everything else. Like you mentioned a minute ago, the, branch, the, the trachea that branches into the main stem bronchus, that branches into the bronchioles, that continues branching all the way down until you have an alveolus at the end, that little, that little ball of cells where gas exchange happens. That's a, you know, that's an amazing structure. And it, and the response of those tissues is very different depending on if you're at the trachea or the bronchioles or the alveoli. But we started so, with alveoli. Um, yeah, quick, all right, so quick question here. Even if you're just modeling um, just a capillary and how the gas exchange occurs in the capillary, I could see how, you know, that would change literally with every breath because the uh, concentration of O2 in a given alveolus would change depending on what you're breathing, how you're breathing, you bet. Are you at so rest? Each, each time. Are you running? What is the what is the barometric pressure of that day? Is it a very you know a, a very sticky wet day? Is it going to rain? All of all of those things influence what you're talking about. But your body has a way That's of crazy. managing all of that. Yeah, and 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 so if you think about us, we're going to have to rebuild that. If you think about it too long, you're going to give up and just say, I can't possibly do something that big. But you start out with something small and you realize, well, I can bring all these small things together. And so that's why modeling was so important because we'd modeled every possible area of the lung. And then we just started bringing these places together and saying, okay, this is what the trachea needs, the cells that are in the trachea, and this is how we need to work with it. And it very much became a piecemeal project like making a quilt where 
we would right. bring the the small bronchioles. How would you make them, and, and, and how would you have an alveolus at the end, and how can that structure be supported, and how would the vascular network work for that? And let's, okay, then let's make five of them. Then let's make sure we can make it for a small lobe. Then let's back that off and make it for a larger structure. And finally, after 15, 16 years, let's figure out the process to make this for a full-size lung. And that's exactly you, how it um, worked. How far are you backing this up? Because also, I'm going heard, back to the point you know, where I was just modeling the alveoli with some with some of the pneumocytes, which are the cells that are in the lung, the type one and type two pneumocytes, growing in a ball, and trying to grow some no, rudimentary no. vascular pieces with that. That's what I was doing 15 years ago. No, what I mean is, um, when you when you take a breath, the breath can come in through the mouth or through the nose. And from what I've read, ah. the nose may release nitric oxide, which gets entrained with the breath, and there may be other filtering systems. So a breath taken from the mouth versus the nose is a may little be different. very different. Wow. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. You're a really different. good biologist. I should have asked you what your background was. <laughs> but uh, well, there I, is a difference. Really? There is a difference. In, but if you think about it, and just if you, even if you didn't think about what the nose did, and you just focused on the lung, from about the point of the in the trachea, from the larynx on. Keep it simple. No larynx, just from the from the trachea down, you know, through the branching airways. There's enough there to worry about. So if you're only making that conduit and you're not trying to recreate it all, it gets a little better. I'm not going to say simple, but see what I mean. But you have to break down your thought to say, if you go the whole way, that's huge. But keep backing it down. And so once you can grow an alveolus. And then you can grow a little bronchial alveolus with some blood vessels, and then you grow a little bit bigger one, and then you add a couple of those. Now you see how a the slow process of doing scientific research means you put these pieces yeah. together, and it take that's why it takes so long to do. Because at the end of the yeah, day, we didn't just want to make a lung. We wanted to make one that would be able to be put in an animal, and the animal wouldn't suffer from having it in them. That it wouldn't make them right. sick. That they would, they may not have full gas exchange, but they wouldn't get sick, and they would be able to let that lung continuing to develop inside of them. How do you not quail in the face of? It's unbelievable the complexity just of this, of this whole of of a lung. <laughs> oh my! In there and exchanging oh my! And filtering pick, and... pick any part of your body, but why we started with something so extremely difficult, and now let's talk about the fact that you're breathing and the only organ that has an external component to it that opens up to the external world that lets you breathe in from our toxic environment is the lung. And so you breathe in a lot of particulate matter. You know, when you're sitting in a room on a bright, shiny day and those sunbeams come in and you see the stuff floating in those sunbeams, that's the stuff you're breathing. It's particles. Yeah. Some of that's pathogenic, we hope not too bad, but some of it's just stuff, and that's what you breathe. And your body's breathing that and getting rid of it every time you breathe. And you're breathing in if you're around other people or you walk down the street, and I don't want to make it so you never want to leave your home again, but anything you touch has the potential to have been touched by somebody else and they've left a respiratory pathogen behind, or they coughed and left it. Or they cough next to you and you breathe in just as they're coughing and you're like, oh, gosh, you know, now I'm infected. Um, and so that's something to think about because we didn't want to just make a bioengineered lung alone. We knew that we also had to create a rudimentary, a very um, simple immune system that would protect you so that the first time that animal um... breathed, it, that, that organ wouldn't get infected and just have graft failure because of infection. Yeah, so what what is this um when you consider let's say the the cells that lie in the trachea or the initial main branch, I don't know if the, uh -huh. the you know the bronchus. Like the main stem bronchus, I would think, yeah. Yeah, the main stem bronchus. This would what this would tell me is that the cells that first encounter, you know, the outside air probably are the most hardy. Their their membranes are probably the, the most selective yeah. because they have to filter out so many pathogens and That's particles true. and as you, you still have to have an immune response the there. So oh, yeah, the yeah. cells are good, and and I will tell you that the lung cells alone, the cells you're talking about, um, and the cells even in an alveolus have an amazing ability to respond to their environment and make factors that drive an immune response. They're not just cells that are part of gas exchange. They're immune cells themselves. They're limited, 
They're not like monocyte macrophages or our lymphocytes that really, you know, our white blood cells that go through our body and control infection, but they can sure give it a good start because they make products that kind of block infection by binding bacterial and virus components so they get kind of stuck together a little bit. Things like surfactant that help the lung pop open easier also have an antibacterial effect. And so the, that's made by type 2 pneumocytes, the cells that are found in your lung. So that's an antibacterial component made by your lung itself, not even with immune cells. So you're right. Those cells are hardy and have an ability to protect. But even more than that, we gave these lungs an, an added immune system um, derived from the animal. Since the cells to make these lungs were coming from a pig, from a single lung that we removed to get the cells to grow the lungs, we also took some blood from these animals and cultured their white blood cells. So when we, at the end of 30 days that we had put a lung together and we were ready to transplant, we gave this white blood cells, we put them back into this organ, and then when they were, the, the organs were transplanted, the cells that were there moved into the lymph tissue of that animal did the way it would naturally. Some stayed in the lung and stayed there protected, but provided a protection so that we didn't see infection and all the animals were on a short antibiotic course that was taken away very quickly, and they were just allowed to breathe and function normally, and that none of them had signs of graft failure from infection, which would be pneumonia. Yeah. So we kind of so, gave um, them an edge. So what is the what is the Pareto of need, or the needs out there, I guess, are lung transplants, of which they're not enough. Um, people... Help for so people the, with asthma, yeah. with so there's pneumonia, a big need. with emphysema. Yeah, with, you know. and same lung, lung disease, COPD and things like that. So as our world gets dirtier and the, the toxic materials in the environment get higher levels, you see more end-stage lung disease. And there's always increasing worldwide um, problems with lung disease. So there are never going to be enough organs, even though a lot of people die. Not all lungs are suitable for transplantation. And Many organs are even injured by the process because lungs are kind of delicate. The process of isolating them for transplantation, you know, procuring them, um, I mean, makes it kind of hard. And then a lot of organs are just rejected because they don't meet the, the requirements. It's a very stringent set of requirements if you're going to get an organ that can be used to transplant into somebody, and it should be. But that means that you've always got people that are waiting. So that's why you know, doing a process too, uh, like this. The, you know, this is another thought. Um, the fact that the lungs are one of the first line defenders or excluders of particulates, pathogens, et cetera, does that mean they're hypersensitive when it comes to their immune response so that when you do transplant, they're like one of the most difficult things to transplant or are they, you know, I guess, quote unquote, relaxed and not so sensitive? You just so asked. Them. Okay. So let me, let me preface this. First, you ask the million dollar question and you deserve the gold star for the day. Because you asked a really high order. No, no. This is a question that's really difficult for people to get, including um, most of the procurement side of, of lung transplant work. So it's hard because the lung is really an immune organ. Every time you have a branch of that airway and a branch of that vascular tree, you have a little area that's called lymph-associated tissue where the white blood cells sit in the lung and they're there right where you need them when you breathe. And the cells move back and forth from this to the areas that you may need it to fight infection or just deal with the fact that you breathe a lot. And you breathe a lot of stuff in that causes problems. So if you think about this, if you think about it that way, the lung is really very much an immune organ, which means that the lung is going to have a lot of cells in it that would be involved also in recognizing something that would be foreign in terms of foreign tissue. So if, if you're transplanting, for a long time, we wondered why, why lung transplants didn't do very well, why the people that received a lung didn't do well. That's because they would procure a lung, and without looking very carefully at getting at least a half tissue match, they would go ahead and use it because they needed them desperately. People that have better than a half tissue match in terms of their tissue type do better because the lung is an immune organ. And no wonder it would reject because it's very good at getting rid of pathogens and the cells are just sitting there waiting to see something that's foreign, you know, like you, because you're going to be foreign yeah. to the immune cells in the lung. That's graft versus host rejection. And then your body's going to see that lung as being not the same as it in terms of a tissue type and say, well, we're going to get rid of you. That's just graft rejection. 
And so that's what made the prognosis after lung transplantation poor for a really long time until we started to look carefully, like we do for other organs, into trying to get a good tissue match. And yeah, I mean, that's the big deal. The whole, even the whole transplant process, it must be so difficult because you can't just let the lungs sit there with no air flowing through it because that's an unnatural state for the cells. Uh-huh. You can't have gas exchange not happening. Uh-huh. You'd have to not only supply air to it continuously, and you'd have to pump it, but you'd have to do but the gas exchange. But you also need to keep fluid flood. moving through those blood vessels. Fluid, yeah. Like we do when we pump our liquid-based media. It looks a lot like Kool-Aid, but it doesn't taste like it. It's salty. It's pink-colored uh. like cherry Kool-Aid, but it's okay. I'm sorry. Yes, we tasted it. You know, <laughs> don't even ask why. We're not supposed to, but but I can tell you that it's salty because it has a lot of salts in it, but it has a lot of nutrient materials. And we pump this. We don't pump blood through our lungs when we grow them. We pump this nutrient solution that we've come through, that we've developed over the years into it. And so that's how we, and we maintain that lung all the way up until the transplant when we do what's called birthing the bioengineered lung when we start pumping air into it and expanding it. It's filtered air at first, but we start doing that before we take it across to the surgical suite before we put it into a pig for transplant. For years, people didn't do that with the the lungs that you use for donors. They would put a solution in them that would help. It's a nutrient solution that's very helpful, but they would put it in ice or in something that kept it cool, and you carry it in a cooler, you know, those little coolers, the little plastic ones. You just carry that little cooler with you and transplant it from one hospital to another to give somebody a donor organ. Well, just what you said, people have, people realized that recently, and they've developed better systems to keep that lung, have air moving through it, that's filtered air, pumping fluid through it, and maintain that while you're getting it to the point of transplant, because that probably affects it, just like you said, just exactly like you said. You know more about most of this than a lot of the people I deal with on a regular basis. And so... Well, recently I've uh, I've been on a, a kick to learn, you know, as much as I can. So I've been studying lungs and I mean, like, you know, there's so many questions. Like I even looked at the fact that the, you know, the heart is have it's kind of in the center of the lungs vertically. So yeah, I wondered, you know, the pressure in the bottom of the lung must be higher than the pressure in the top. And, you know, what is that? There are pressure so, differentials. So what, there are pressure differentials. What happens, and, when you, you know, what happens when you lay down versus stand up? You know, or what if you go upside down? What does the lung do to accommodate? Okay, so let's let's make this even better because I can answer some of what you're asking me in a different way. So okay. we made bioengineered tissues, and that was part partly why we got a lot of attention. We also did a project where we made some of these lung models, these organoids. And in, in August of 2017, we made 38 replicate organoids, half of which we kept on the ground and half we sent to the International Space Station. Because in the International Space Station, there's no gravity. And on Earth, we have our normal gravity. So you're talking about pressures as you move and change the body orientation. We did it even better. We talked you to gravity or no gravity and then compared the differences between what those tissues look like because they flew for two weeks at at the space station and then they came back to Earth. Well, actually, the astronauts that were there, Peggy Whitson and Randy Bresnick and, and some of the other astronauts, actually looked at how the organoids developed, took samples of the products the lungs were making in space, and then finally fixed them so they could come back to Earth and I could compare the two sets. And we did this because we wanted to see what would long-term space flight do to your lungs. If we went to Mars, what would happen to your lungs? Just your lungs. Because that's what I do. I mean, I was I cared about other things too, but we had developed this experiment to do it, and it took us a long time to get on the list of, to be able to fly. Well, what you're asking me, I can tell you right now, just cells that are in the space station, they behave very differently. The cells, um, the tissues that developed weren't the same as the tissues that developed on Earth and our on our ground controls. And depending on just something like how much gravity was present changed how those tissues formed and repaired themselves and functioned. Okay, so that's a big difference. So sometimes you have to look at a big difference to answer questions about small differences. What you're asking about pressures and all of this, we just had two years ago a person join our lab who is a cardiothoracic radiologist who's developed procedures to measure pressures and changes that occur with somebody laying down or somebody standing up. All the things you just asked me. Because we're going to take our animals and do this with them. And even there are studies with people that have been published that we've looked at that that suggest that as you move, 
for somebody who's bedridden, their responses are very different, and they get fluid buildup because the lungs don't function the same way because they're laying down all the time. And well, so they're, too, they're a quadrupedal animal. Oh yeah, a quadrupedal animal would have very different lung morphology than bipedal because you know our lungs are up down and you know well again, that's much more of a pressure gradient than a dog would say. Oh, I'm, I wish my research partner were here because he's always questioned me. Why would you want to study polywog and frog development of the lung and this development of the lung? And I'm like, well, here's the reason why. I can understand just like we were saying. Do those comparisons. Why is a bird lung different? Why is a bird lung much more efficient than our lung in oxygenation? Or how, or, or how did that develop? How did that the... happen? You know, how did you develop that over, over? You know, the years and years and years and years of evolution, why did it develop that way? Because the reptilian lung is very different than a bird lung. And yet, in the past, they both came from the same grouping. You know, if you go back in time you, in terms of you something that may, uh, You want to tell you something that may either make you laugh or surprise you? Because I've spoken to uh, one scientist that says emphysema in certain disease states is uh-huh. a regression to a, a former form of a lung, like Emphysema, you know, the alveoli clump together into one. They clump big together, one. right, and they atrophy. They, you know, they, right, but that looks more like an amphibian lung. It's less, yes. uh, less differentiation. So it's, one guy I spoke to, he actually is postulating that it's a regression in terms of development back to an earlier stage of the lung in, a, in an attempt for the lung to save itself. Yep. So it, it has knowledge somehow of its previous state in other creatures from. Or that's you know, a default state. You know, so as a, what I mean by a default state is that's an earlier possible form that was developed and built upon to make some improvement. So you default back to the lowest state that you could be in terms of development that still gives function. That's exactly it. I mean, I'm, you know, and there are a lot of other things that play into it and why the disease happens and changes that occur in the cells and the material that they lay down that beca- that's the scaffold of the lungs themselves. You know, so we can't use lungs from people who have severe COPD to grow cells on because the cells do not like the stiff skeleton that's left behind of the collagen and elastin of that lung when you take the cells away from the person that we, you know, we had a sample from and we just grow the cells on it. The cells don't, normal cells don't like that. They just don't like it because it's way too stiff than what they should have. It's not it's not normal anymore, and they start remodeling it right away and changing it into something that is more normal, as much as they can. Okay. Yeah. So, so well, you know, I've I've been I apologize I've been asking you eight million questions, but what are what are some of the amazing surprising things that you've seen throughout all your years of research about the lung that that just uh, I mean just amazing. So when you think about it, I mean. Animals, and and most animals and people, can survive on one lung. And so that in itself is amazing. Your lung, its layer doesn't get bigger. It may stretch out a little bit more, but it doesn't get bigger. It doesn't make many more alveoli. It does adapt a little bit, but it kind of stays steady state. And, and, And yet it provides what you need for support. There are some animals whose lungs continue to develop, though. Like, well, rats, for instance. Rat lungs are very different than human lungs. And rats can continue to have some development even after they're mature while they're vermin. And they developed and, you know, developed this way evolutionarily to be able to survive in, in this situation. Um, so there's some amazing things like that that you, you kind of see in terms of what I, you know, over the years of what we've looked at. Um, the fact that, you know, bottom line, how that the, the immune system of the lung cannot make you so that you can't breathe because it responds so severely. It's a moderated response, you know, to the pathogens that, are, that might you breathe on a regular basis, but you're not sick all the time. Your lung immune system manages that. That in itself is absolutely amazing. So it's not reactive because you've got all the stuff that's coming in. It's a conditioned response. It's modulated, and yet you clear anything that comes into your body, and you continue breathing, and we're not sick all the time. These are some of the amazing yeah. things. I mean, I mean, like you have a, you said you have a thousand questions. I probably have ten thousand questions. Every time we find something <laughs> out, it opens a door that said, "Wow, I never thought of it that way before," or "Wow, you know, yeah, I didn't, cool. I didn't know the cells could 
could could grow to this point and they they would actually um it, that you really needed to have vascular cells and lung cells grow together to get the membranes to be thick enough or thin enough actually to allow for gas exchange if you have one without the other they they grow and they're lovely but to get the response you need they both have to be together as they develop we didn't know that and that's if you think about it it does make some sense because it's a close association but we kind of think, you know, like like pieces and parts you take out of your car. I can take this one out and stick it in, and it doesn't matter if it's a used part or a new part. In this case, the stuff at that level, at that micro level, where the cells live and, and function, it's really critical that they develop side by side. So well, I think people probably assume that there's there's not nearly as much cell to cell communication and signaling as there is. I mean, oh, and it's three dimensional. Yeah, it's three-dimensional, which the space study showed that if the cells aren't in contact with each other, if because there's no gravity they can't get next to each other really well, they can't move as well, they just kind of float around and they get kind of confused. And so instead of maturing, they kind of proliferate a lot, which means make more of themselves, like a progenitor cell. Like you're wound healing, but you're not controlling it where you, where you grow a lot of cells to cover the wound site and then the cells mature and you've got... Maybe you maybe have a little scar, but you you seal your skin. In the lung, what the cells did, we sent to space, is they proliferated. We had a lot more of them, but they didn't mature into the cells that were involved in gas exchange. They stayed very immature, which says wound healing in space is going to be kind of bad and different. It also says that we'll probably adapt to that environment. But the people that we send to Mars are not going to be the same as the people that stay on Earth. They're going to evolve and adapt in a different way. What about the, is there a microbiome of the cells in the lung? Oh, and is there the microbiome is huge. And so part of the research study that we we published in August of, of 2018, beyond looking at just what, that we made a bioengineered lung, we put it in the animals, so and here's what happened with the tissue development, is we also evaluated the redevelopment of the microbiome in these animals. And it was really important because it's not so much did we want to, control that microbiome. We wanted to see where the the reconstitution came from. Was it from the trachea? Was it from the gut? Because you have to think too, if you know a little bit about transplantation and graft failure, bad microbiomes can influence graft failure. Good microbiomes might be able to support graft survival. So our first step was to know how quickly the microbiome reestablished and it really was a matter of hours, actually, as that microbiome reestablished. And did we see any pathogens? Because remember, we had a functional immune system. But we didn't see an overgrowth of pathogens. It stayed very normal, very much like what the, the normal lung, the, the native lung that was left behind that we left in the animal so that it could breathe while we were playing on the other side by making a bioengineered lung and putting it in. That microbiome, we think, is very important. And learning how to influence it like we do the gut I mean, you see all those commercials for, you know, your gut microbiome, keep your gut happy, drink this product, right. you know. Same thing may be true of your lung, and maybe when we go to do transplants in the future for the lung, we won't just produce a lung, or do it, a, but we'll treat that lung before we transplant it in a way that makes sure that pathogens don't grow in it for a period of time after transplantation. Well, beyond, yeah, beyond just pathogens, I mean, like the, the inside of the lung the air exposed side is like its own niche. So I would think oh, it's, and it's amazing. Would, yes. would hang out there. Have we, have we looked at the, they, um, the strains of particular bacteria that live inside the, you know, the trachea and the bronchus? We did. We compared the microbes in the trachea and the microbes in the lung itself. We want, really would like to do a bigger study where we look at the trachea, the bronchi, the, the main stem bronchus, the bronchioles, and then the lung at the alveoli level, and see what that different microbiome is at every level. What's the constitution of the organisms there? And then see what happens if you don't give the lung an immune system before we transplant it. What happens to that microbiome? Is it a bad microbiome? What happens if we do a therapeutic that would modulate that microbiome? Would it be a good one? Could we do that same thing for somebody who has cystic fibrosis and has problems with organisms that have overgrown that are pathogenic like pseudomonas? Can we treat that lung we put into them that's normal and have it not have pseudomonas and not even let pseudomonas grow on it? So you, you see, think there's strains of, uh, of bacteria in the lung that actually help that are necessary to the function of the lung? I feel like uh, I've heard I, just 80% yeah. of our serotonin gets produced in the gut. 
is there something in the lung, you know, some kind of bacteria or bacterial strains that are critical to the functioning of the lung? Probably. Remember, but for most of the, my life or in your life, everybody told you the lung was sterile. There's nothing there. It's a sterile environment. How that right. that happened that you could breathe and have it immediately be sterile always intrigued me, and I didn't believe it. But it's not a sterile environment. Okay, I I don't always believe people when they tell me stuff. Maybe that means I was a bad bad uh, student. But but basically That's at this good. stage you can't believe everything everybody tells you. You have to say, okay, what's your basis? And I tell my own students that if somebody tells you that this is how it works, or I tell you that's how it works, say how can you prove it? And I should be able to prove it to you. Right. So the proof of this would be to to look and see what that microbiome does, and then I can go back to modeling and say. What does a normal microbiome do to the tissues? How do they talk to each other? What is good about it and what might bad be? What organisms might be bad organisms and how would they do? Just what you said. I can model that and evaluate it. Actually, I should write a grant and get funding to do that because that sounds really like it would be fun and very useful. Yeah. And so, and that's one thing we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about some problems with the project like this one. If I told you, and I'm walking down the street and I meet you and I say, hey, you know, nice day, nice to meet you, and, and, and I say, hey, um, I need money to fund a, I want to make bioengineered lungs to, for, to give them to people. I want to make them in my lab and give them to people um, as a clinical um, therapeutic for people that need them for end-stage lung disease. Um, and you would look at me and say, I'm not going to give you a nickel because that sounds nuts. That's exactly what funding agencies do for high-risk projects like the one I have. Um, uh, okay. And I don't blame them. No matter how much you model, no matter even proving with a short feasibility study that we weren't going to kill our animals, that they were going to survive and everything would work well, it's still high-risk research. It's high benefit, but high risk, high risk of failure is what we're talking about. I'm probably going to fail, and we do fail. My students hate it when I say that. We fail more than we succeed. But that's okay in our projects. We know that this is high risk of failure, and we still do it because we learn more from our failures than we ever do from our successes. And every time something well, fails, is, um, we figure out how and why. No, I mean, You're, you know, when people give the example of baseball, the top baseball players, you know, hit a third of the balls pitched to them. And, you know, yeah. Like batting average, or less than that. Less than that. But so, exactly. And that's why you pay them the big dollar. Because why is this high risk? If their if, rates if, are better. Because high risk is that I wouldn't believe me if I went up to myself 15 years ago and said, hey, honey, you know, uh, you know, I got this scheme for you that I can grow lungs for people that need them, um, but we're going to fail for the first 15 years. And then you're going to have a good feasibility study, and then you may fail for another 10 years before you get it to the point where it's good enough to be evaluated by, you know, for clinical use. Are you going to want to fund me for those 25 years that I've been not being super productive in your eyes because I'm not I succeeding? Do. I'm failing. And so that's why it's hard to get funding. I can get funded to model the lung, and I do that often. I can get funding from federal, you know, agencies to do that that kind of work. But to get something super high risk funded is really hard to do. And so we cool. do this work on very little money, um, mostly indirects from grants, from other grants that we have. We had a pilot. Um, we had $50,000 from somebody who gave it to me, um, gave it, donated it to our, our fund um, to, that paid for the animals in our feasibility study. And then all of the people that work on this project, nobody gets a salary from it. When we do an, well, a day you, when we're... Why don't, you, uh, why don't you cloak what you do? And let's say in order to test transplanting a lab-grown lung into a dog, mm -hmm. you need uh, 12 supporting studies. Why not put forth grants for the 12 supporting studies and just uh -huh. say you're modeling? But in reality, these are all the support pieces for your eventual... That's and that's, and you've that? got it. You're smart. That's exactly how you do it. And it's not cloaking it. It's being open about it, but saying, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to model the bronchial. I'm going to model the alveolus. I'm going to look at how to grow vascular cells and lung cells side by side. And that's exactly what you do. It's not cloaking it, but you know, it comes to a point after you've been doing this for a long time that you turn around and say, I'd like to be funded just once before I retire to do the project that I do. 
to be open and see, with everybody and say, look, I want to I want to do long term survival of the bioengineered lungs. I want to make twenty five of them, and I want to transplant in twenty five pigs, send them back to the farm, bring them back after six months, and look and see how well the lungs survived, grew, did everything they're supposed to do and get funded for that particular project. And that's the harder thing to do because it still is high risk. So scientists do exactly what you say. We break it all apart into into manageable pieces that nobody gets crazy. But in the paper we published, we did microbiome, we did the genetics, we did transcriptome, we did what the tissues looked like, we looked at the immune response, we did 50 things. And, you know, it took a while to do it. Well, what if you, I mean, what's the statistic right now on people that uh, need lung transplants but can't get them and because of that they die? I mean, maybe that creates such a counterbalancing, dire, urgent need that you do get the funding you want if you put it in those terms. Okay, and, and I do. And I, and I give the percentages of people and I talk about that there's no other therapeutic for end-stage lung disease. Um, we provide people with oxygen support until that doesn't work anymore, but there's really no therapeutic option except for transplantation, and and that's the truth. But again, this is high risk no matter what, and I'm you know, and so I'm I'm not I'm not telling you because I want it, I I just want people to understand that this is the kind of work that's really important, but it's a harder mechanism to get funded as it is, and um you know like I said in that small pilot that we did. The clinicians, I could not afford to pay a part of my the clinician's salary. So the anesthesiologist is a guy who does anesthesia for transplant people. He takes it. We all take a vacation day on the day we do a transplant. We all take a vacation day. Everybody does from their jobs that they do. My my cardiothoracic surgeon flies himself in. He was in Boston. He was he would fly himself in from Boston and stay overnight and pay for his own ticket and everything to do the surgery. And then he'd fly home after the surgery, and we'd take care of the animal. Um, you know, so everybody donated their time to it because without pushing the limits occasionally and everybody thinking that this was important enough, you're not going to get anywhere. And that's exactly how we did it. And so, and I'm proud of that. I'm very proud that everybody believed enough in the project that everybody did the same thing. Um, And and so that's sometimes how high risk stuff gets done. People care enough to go out of their way to do it and beggar themselves to do it. And so things like, an individual who wants to take over and privatize space flight, who takes every single penny he has and beggars himself to build something like SpaceX, that's how you make a big difference. You know, Excellent. you have to be willing to risk it all. And I'm not a great gambler, but you have to be willing to risk it all to get a, a good benefit for something that's really high risk. But we did it. And we're going to do our best to get funded for the next stage, which is that long-term survival. And we're going to keep pushing the envelope with it until we take this as far as we possibly can and teach as many students as we possibly can, because that's part of what I do, too, so that, you know, like that relay race, when I'm going to retire, I look at my students and say, okay, I took this as far as I could. You're going to take it to the clinic. It's your turn. Right. So that's how it works. Um, Okay. Well, um, I guess just to restate simply, so how far have you gotten? You've transplanted a grown lung into what and did it survive and what happened? So our pilot study had six pigs in it. Um, Two of the pigs after the pneumonectomy, because we take one lung out and then use that lung as a cell source to build the lung we're putting back in. Again, because we didn't want to have to immune suppress the animals. We wanted to know what the immune response might be to the bioengineered tissues we were making because nobody really knows what that is. And so four pigs received a lung. Four pigs survived the transplant. And they were survived, and I say were survived because this is a study. They had to be euthanized at time points, 10 hours, two weeks, one month, two months. And they all received a lung, and they all did well, and nobody had a problem because they received a lung transplant. And um, our first pig didn't even cough afterwards, and he was on his feet within two hours of getting his surgery and begging for Oreo cookies because that's what we had trained him with. We, We Oreo cookie trained him just like they do in pig races, he would do anything for an Oreo cookie, even stand there and as I fed him cookies and let one of the people check his tube, his drainage tube from his lung. Remember the clinicians I work with, I grew up on a farm and knew what pigs and are used to them. Um, all the physicians I work with didn't have any idea what it would be like to work with a pig patient. So, you know, you know you there was a learning curve there. Do, 
do a study where you give a pig a cigarette and you smoke him like an hour after the transplant, you know, to see how effective it was. Ah, uh, <laughs> after one, okay, did I tell you that we're a small lab and did I tell you that we kind of babysit these lungs 24-7 when we're growing them until I can come up with the funding to put a camera so I can stay home and look at it all night? Um, no, no, yeah, I'm just kidding you. But, but we don't want our pigs smoking. Study like that. Yeah, but but there is but now do, like that. It was so successful. Now do you see? Yeah, the later. pig was smoking a cigarette later. <laughs> well, we're happy that he was eating his Oreo cookies later. So, um, but I mean, but that he was fine. Not he didn't cough. He didn't have any issues, and he was very very happy. And we we take very good care of our animals anyway, and and that's part of the process. If you're going to do animal model studies, you need to be a very conscientious person and make sure you never do any harm. And again, why did it take like 17 years before we got here? Because it was took that long before we got to the point where my whole team looked at each other and said, "We're good enough to put it into an animal, and we know our animal's going to survive." And they did. So, again, a clarifying question: Did you did you put in an entire pig lung? And did we have put in lungs? an entire pig lung? No, no, we put we put an entire pig lung in. So we took out one lung. And we left them. We left them with their right lung. We took out the left lung, and then we created a left lung, we, a scaffold, and we took the cells we isolated from that pig's lung that we removed, and put them on the scaffold, following a recipe that took years to develop. That said, what were the factors that needed to be there? What what nutrients needed to be there? How, what cells went in at what time frame? And then we produced that lung that grew for 30 days in a big chamber that we call a bioreactor. But it's really just you could do it in a beaker if you had to, a big glass container, and let that lung grow for 30 days and continue to develop before we transplanted it into our pigs. And so each pig got a lung made for him or her alone out of their own cells so that we would be able to evaluate is there an immune response to cells grown for 30 days outside of you? So if we took cells out of your lung and I grew a lung for you, would your body say, welcome home, we missed you after being gone for 30 days? Or would your body say, wait a minute, we don't recognize you anymore. Get away from us. Mm -hmm. And that's what we needed to be able to evaluate. So, And it worked. And we're, we were thrilled. And we're ready to take it off and do the next steps. And so, so the next step is um, what's do the long-term more. Do long-term of survival. This? Yeah, do long-term survival. Do a larger number. Prove that we can do this like if we were a bakery baking a cake. We can make a lung the same way using the same recipe again and again and again, and it turns out perfectly and ready to go into okay. that animal in the time frame that it needs to be. And that's what right, we're talking well, about. One, okay. Well, I got one, um, one last question. Uh, okay. So we look. And, in, in, you know, in looking at lungs through all the years and learning about them and maybe studying, you know, other creatures' lungs, is there a lung like, you know, if people were to continue to evolve or is there a next stage of lung that you can envision? Like, how would you make a, a better lung than what we have? Have you ever thought about that? And what Ooh, would it look like? Oh, yes, I have. Yes, I have very much because um, our lungs are good, but they're not as efficient as they could be. And we had talked about birds earlier. Birds have a highly efficient lung that oxygenates super well with a lot less fuss than ours do. So if you wanted to make it better, if you're looking at not waiting for evolution to continue doing it the way we're doing it now, I would say you'd probably want to engineer something that was modeled more after bird lungs than ours. Not necessarily making a structure that, like, take a bird scaffold and grow our lung cells on it, although there are scientists that have thought about that kind of thing. But I mean taking the lung and maybe doing something like our future is going to be, bioprint a lung, and eventually we'll be able to do this. Right now we can't. But bioprint the skeleton of a lung and maybe print the cells along with it, but print it in a structure that could be transplantable, looks on the outside like our lung, but internally looks more like a bird lung. And if I were going to develop it and grow it that way, and, and I have to be able to bioprint it, I can't use anything existing now because there are some things I have to do more like us than the bird, like the branching airways and some points have to be more like ours than, than birds do, than avian ones. But the alveoli I'd make differently. Um, I'd make it more like what you see in a bird. Does that make sense? I thought a bird's lung is like a flow-through lung where, you know, in our lungs we breathe in and we breathe out the same opening. But I thought a bird's lung somehow is like a flow-through where stuff never comes in 
sits and then gets pushed out the same way, it kind of continuously flows in. Now it does, but that's through. why I'd want it to be. So what the bird lung is is when they inhale and exhale, it's a little bit different structure like you're talking about. And um, the air sacs are designed a little bit differently. But if we if we took some of what they had there in how the structures are formed, they, they're much more efficient because you get a flow back and forth and you work at a different gradient level for oxygen. That's what I'm after. So I'd like to mimic the fact that you might be able to do that. And so you've got it, – it, it's different from ours in how it's constructed to – to let you do that airflow back and forth, but that would enhance the efficiency of how we breathe. And so um, the, the the efficiency from the avian system is because of that unidirectional mechanism and the structure of the of the bronchial system, the you know the little small tubes before the alveolar space. Those are really different in birds. And the air capillaries in the walls, the capillaries that support this, have a larger surface area. So those are the things that I would say I would like to mimic. There are some parts of how that structure is there that I wouldn't want to have. I want to have it be more like human. But that bigger surface area is what supports more oxygen um, coming in and more carbon dioxide leaving. That's what makes the bird lung more efficient. I'd like to mimic some of that okay. in it, and I'd bioprint something that would let me do that. So, so that's what Very I'm cool. looking at. Changing that, again, going at the smallest level of what a lung is, changing that ultrastructure component to make it look more like a bird and less like us okay. and enhance and enhance that efficiency. And that may be the answer even for devices that we might construct that might be an external device that was not your bioengineered lung, but your artificial partly bioengineered lung that helped you support you while you were waiting for transplantation. And I know that's Those the future. Years, yeah, I know. Could you ever we ventilate someone that... Could you ever ventilate someone in a flow-through manner instead of a inhale-exhale manner? Um, you mean like being in a that... negative pressure environment, like an iron lung, where you pull... no, like where you breathe, you breathe in, but you know, like I guess literally, if you had the, you know, the, the trachea is where the air comes in and goes out, but you wouldn't have to know, have that you... part. You would just have to have the part that allowed the air exchange with your blood vessels, and so you'd be running blood through this bioengineered device that we create mm. so we connect it to your vascular system and it would it would have like what the bird lung does much more surface area so that you could enhance that gas exchange and it wouldn't have to be like a lung okay. and it could work in a negative pressure way that said change this diaphragm and pull the just like an iron lung change that pressure pull the thing open compress that push everything out very much like a diaphragmatic control, and then we, it might be able to provide support for you. And by the way, this doesn't exist anywhere except in my head. <laughs> <Very cool. laughs> okay. I just wanted to give you that last caveat. Um, don't think that this exists. And, 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 and that's the hard part of what I do, is that um, because of our project, and we had really great results and we got a lot of press about it, people think that that small feasibility study, that we're ready to put it into people because they're desperate. I mean, if you can't know, breathe or a loved one you have yeah. can't breathe and they have end-stage lung disease and they're going to die, they're going to jump at anything. And very often I have people contact me. And, I, you know, I feel for them. I, I, the reason that we do this work, even though it's high risk and it's tiring and it hasn't been all been a, a walk in the park the whole time we've been doing that, there's a lot of hard work with this. Yeah. It's the people that need it and the fact that I see more and more people with that little oxygen tank dragging behind them wherever I go. <laughs> and that really, you know, there's a dire need and I get it, but I feel bad. And I call. And so if somebody emails me, mails me, calls me, I make sure I contact everyone back and I say, I understand your pain. I feel for you, but this is not ready for, for use yet, even for people that say, I'll be your first guinea pig. I'm like, it's not even good yeah, enough for yeah. me to even think about that yet. Give me another 10 years and I might have a chance, but I don't want to take hope away from people. But in reality, I still want to give them the best thing I can possibly do. And at the end of the day, what we're doing is with, not good enough. Yeah, if they made a movie with you in it, then they would just show like, you know, a montage of cut scenes where you do make up a, you know, a human lung quick, quick and put it in someone to save them. But unfortunately, real life's not like that. And that's a movie. And real life is nowhere near that. And by the way, 
I want you to have the best thing that you deserve for you or your loved one. I don't want something that is is going to fail you. And that's why I have to do the long-term survival studies and evaluations to make sure that I can do this again and again and again and again the same way without failure for anybody who might need one. And that's that's the hard okay. part. And that's why, you know, that's the hardest part of what I do. This is not progressing fast enough to save people the way that it should. And I feel that every day. And yet we still get well, up, my good. whole team does, and we do it again. No, that's great. That's really great. So, so um, yeah, we're at the end of the time, but what, what's the best way for folks to learn more and to, you know, see what you're doing in the lab, you know, online, get in contact? So, so if you um, put in Joan Nichols, if you type in Joan Nichols on a Google search, um, University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, UTMB, so Joan Nichols, UTMB, uh, my university has uh, has a website that shows a lot of what we do on it and, and lists it. Um, if you want to know more, you can email me, Nichols at utmb.edu. And I may be slow in responding to you, but I respond to every single email everyone sends me. Um, I will tell you about the work that we do, and um, that's about probably the best way to get a hold of me. The rest of the time, I'm in the lab. Okay. Yeah. You're in your alveolus of a lab working. I'm in my alveol yeah. in the lab working. Yep. So. Well, very good. Well, Jane, I mean, Joan, uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, you are welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.